Hi, my name is Leah. Hi, my name is Lyris. And we're doing a tour of the Haley House. The Haley House was founded in 1966 by the original owners, Kathy and John McKenna. Kathy McKenna is from New York, and her husband, John McKenna, was from Roxbury, and he worked as an attorney, and he passed away in 2015. When Kathy and John were living in Boston, they noticed that a lot of intoxicated people were being arrested every day, so they decided to try to resolve this issue. Starting out, they rented out a basement apartment in South End, Boston, on Trentmont Street. They began to take in homeless men they found sleeping on the street and provided them with a cot and a meal. And a majority of the occupants at the shelter were men because women and men didn't tend to mix well in shelters, according to Kathy. This simple act of hospitality ranched into what is now known as the Healy House Soup Kitchen and Living Community. The soup kitchen is run by people that had nowhere to live who were taken from the streets in exchange for a place to call home. Today, the Haley House and Soup Kitchen serves organically cooked meals to the people of South End, Boston, and Roxbury. There's also an elderly meal program and a food pantry. Okay, now moving on to why this site was named the Haley House. The Haley House was named after a 24-year-old man, a founding member of the Catholic Interracial Council named Leo Haley, whose legacy carries on as a good Samaritan of the community and great friends of the McKennas. There's a quote by Kathy McKenna that I think perfectly captures the essence of what the Haley House truly is. And she says, our mission is not food and it's not homeless services. Our mission is breaking down barriers. As a result today, the Haley House owns and manages 109 affordable housing units throughout Boston South End. So, I haven't been to the Haley House, but all of this has moved me to want to go and try their food. The things they are doing for the community are very important, and especially from my experience of feeding the homeless, it makes a big impact. Yeah, and I definitely support what the Haley House is doing as well, because I actively work at food pantries, so I can understand the importance of providing families with food and the need of passion for connecting with your community. Hopefully, our presentation has encouraged you to visit the Haley House, which is less than a five-minute walk away from... Um, where we are. Um, when you go, I urge you to try some of the locals' favorite meals, which are chicken and waffles, bowls, um, wraps, jerk chicken, and if you have a sweet tooth like me, try their chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, and they also have free Wi-Fi, which I know everyone loves, and they have a very diverse and friendly environment, and as of now, they're a black-owned business. Thank, Thank you, you for, for stopping by at the Haley House. House. And the and next stop on the tour is the Black Market. Hello everyone, I'm Olivia and I'd like to welcome you all to Dudley's Black Square Market. This building was founded in the summer of 2017 here on Washington Street by Katie Grant, a former beauty industry expert and her husband, Christopher, to serve as a pop-up shop for the Roxbury community. Their main purpose? Helping new aspiring black artists and vendors showcase and sell their products with the hope of building a name for their own businesses while sharing aspects of black culture to newcomers. Originally, Black Market was first created in order to eliminate Boston's wealth gap between predominantly white neighborhoods and revamp the community's appearance. The grants wanted to boost economic success for black owned businesses by giving them a foundation to start selling their innovative creations that would attract more and more customers and investors. During the 1960s, pop-up shops were common in Roxbury, for they proved to be effective in spreading awareness about brands. Unfortunately, as crimes and violence became more prevalent in urban areas as, re as a result of the 1980s crack epidemic, the use of pop-up shops started to die down as people felt unsafe leaving their homes. However, now that some time has passed and the streets of Roxbury are less chaotic, the Grants thought that it would be good for pop-up shops to make a comeback in the community and help out those who struggle with getting their name out. Today, Black Market is regarded as Boston's number one place for people to gather and shop. In the span of three years, Black Market Nubian has hosted 81 marketplaces, 64 events, three festivals, and four health and wellness classes, accumulating more than 30,000 visitors. You're probably wondering what makes the Black Market Nubian so monumental. 
Not only does it endorse local black owned businesses, but it allows people to express their creativity, which in turn bring more life into the community. In an interview conducted back in 2020, Katie Grant speaks about the importance of where black market is located, Nubian Square. She says that it's driven by a spirit of love and collective unity. I hope you enjoyed the black market and the next on our tour is the bowling building. My name is Maya Brewster and today I will be touring the bowling building. Bruce Carlton Bowling was a politician and businessman in Boston, Massachusetts. He served as the first president of the Boston City Council in the mid-1980s. Bowling was educated at Boston English High School, Northeastern University in Cambridge, and received a master's degree in education from Cambridge College. He was, the city's most, he was from the city's most politically successful black family. His father, Royal L. Bowling, was a state senator, and his brother, Royal L. Bowling Jr., served as state representative. In 2015, the Ferdinand Building in then Dudley Square, now Nubian Square, was named the Bruce C. Bowling Municipal Building in his honor. The dedication ceremony was attended by his brother, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, Boston's Mayor Marty Walsh, and other Massachusetts politicians. Finished in 2015, the building was created in the heart of Roxbury, today known as Nubian Square and formerly known as Dudley Square. The 215,000 gross square foot building was a project in the vision known as Dudley Square Vision Project and pursued by former mayor of Boston, Thomas M. Menino, to revitalize the once thriving urban neighborhood. The building today is the, heart, is the headquarters of Boston Public Schools and includes state-of-the-art office space, retail, civic spaces, and community meeting spaces. The building's second floor is home to Roxbury's Innova Innovation Center. The Innovation Center is used for virtual programs and spaces, creating impactful and strong relationships amongst the community. The mission is to provide resources for anyone to successfully launch and grow a business. The Innovation Center has a large impact on the community in the Boston area. The Bowling Building has been a highlight of many community events with exceptionally high youth attendance. Events like graduations, network events, cocktail parties, She Speaks Well, which is a public speaking workshop, art gallery events, and ethnic studies nights have been hosted here. These events engage the community and have played a significant role in keeping Boston's liveliness here and thriving. Now you will be touring Marcus Garvey Gardens. Hello, my name is Steven and I'm going to be touring Marcus Garvey Gardens. Born the 17th of August, in, in 1887, Marcus Garvey grew up in St. Anne, Jamaica during a time when they were still colonized. Garvey would go on to attend the University of Birkbeck in London, where he studied philosophy and law. After graduating from Birkbeck, Garvey became convinced that uniting all people of African descent would improve their overall situation. So, in July of 1914, Garvey formed a Universal Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica, and later established the New York branch two years later. In August of 1918, he would go on to found the Negro World, a newspaper that expressed ideas of his organization and the problems that related, that related specifically to people of African uh, descent. The Marcus Garvey Gardens was built in 1980 and was originally intended to house the handicapped and disabled. Financed by the Mass Housing Finance Agency, it represents the, the result of 10 years of housing advocacy by the Roxbury Action Program. Minority employment during construction of the building was nearly 60% uh, across all trades, providing various job opportunities for minority people. 
Um, the property include uh, offers 161 units of um, 161 units, of which 155 are one bedroom apartments. The remaining six are three bedroom apartment houses with two full baths. Other property uh, property amenities include a community center, uh, a courtyard area with large benches, a community garden located alongside the building, and on-site uh, laundry facilities. In 1919, uh, Garvey would go on to purchase the first of many Liberty Halls in Harlem, New York. With a seating capacity of 6,000, the hall would go on to host UNIA meetings every Sunday evening. Also in 1919, Garvey established the Negro Factories uh, Corporation. The corporation would go on to generate income and provide approximately 700 jobs throughout its many enterprises for minority people. Garvey believed that white society would never see blacks as equals. Therefore, he called for a separate self-development of people of African descent. Hence why apartment buildings in predominantly black communities all around the America are named after him. The Marcus Garvey Gardens are an example of that right here in Roxbury. And now for the next stop on tour, Dilway House. Good morning, everyone. My name is Devon. And my name is Tiana. Have you guys ever been walking through John Elliott Square and seen this bright yellow house? Well, we researched the Delaware House and the history behind why it was special to the Washbury community. For starters, the Delaware House was constructed in 1750, which was the first church in Roxbury. Reinvert Oliver Peabody began construction of the house. He died in 1752 before the house was finished. I'm going to pass on the market to Tiana to talk more about the building. The property has been carefully restored by the Commonwealth as a museum home to the Roxbury community in 1984. In 1984, the Commonwealth was founded, funded, mm, the Commonwealth founded Roxbury Heritage State Park and provided funding to restore the Dillaway Thomas House and develop a park. The property was opened to the public in 1992 and became the headquarters for the Heritage State Park. This house is named after Charles K. Dillaway and General John Thomas. Devine, would you care to explain why? Charles K. Dillaway was the headmaster of Boston Line School until he was ill, which forced him to resign. A group of Japanese students were educated by Dillaway in the house in the 1850s and left many special Japanese artifacts. Then there was a General John Thomas, who was a lieutenant for the Contentional Army, where that house served as headquarters for the Contentional Army. Tiana, why was it significant to the Roxbury community? The establishment was significant to the Roxbury community because the Dillaway House is one of the oldest standing structures in Boston that links right to the revolution. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mary and I'm a junior at Lincoln Sudbury. Hi, I'm Nazia Springer and I'm a senior at Hingham High School. And today we'll be talking about the Mel King mural. Teamwork leads to dream work and it's not about me, it's about we, is what Mel King said. It was found on November 22nd, 2019, when Mel King had a dedication ceremony at the former high school known as Boston Technical High School to Madison Park TVHS. This mural is dedicated to Mel King, an American politician, community organizer, and educator. He created programs and institutions for low-income people in Boston and is the founder and current director of the South End Technology Center. His community leadership has helped tremendously and a mural is well deserved. It's important to recognize him and his work because we need all the help we can get in this community. We need to recognize the people who help us. You pass by it so many times you may not notice it. Because Mel King did so many great things, there was a mural of him on the building of Madison High School. To show appreciation of all the things he did and to keep his, this continuous reminder of his strong support in fighting for the Black community. When the mural first went up, the Mel King Institute of Community Building, MACDC, which I'll speak about later, said, we are privileged to carry his name and be inspired by him every day to build community in Boston, as he has done and continues to do. Mel King founded the MACDC, a nonprofit organization that supports affordable housing and community develop, development. 
It helped bring the community organization, organizers and leaders from across America to reflect, research and study urban community politics, economics, social life and education, housing and media, because we need to bring people together and stay separate instead of staying separate. He also created the new majority in organization and program uniting Boston's community of color around candidates of elective office. Lastly, he helped organize a sit-in at the Boston Redevelopment Authority BRA office in 1968 in protest of the planned parking garage that was going to be built where housing had been leveled. They faced police retaliation between 100 and 400 people occupied the lot. They built tents and wooden shanties and put up a large sign welcoming the media and visitors to Tent City. You might say he's a Superman because he's not 92 and still supporting the community. I support the mission of this site because I think it's important to recognize him because of how hard he's worked to create things like the MADC, MACDC and BRA. Mel King has had a huge impact on Boston. His advocacy for change in housing, technology, job creation, medical education, economic development for people of color and was a mentor to women, men, and children and is the reason that till this day, the mural is still there. You can go visit any visit at any time. And some fun facts about, here's some fun facts about Mel King. He has been an activist for over 55 years. He's a professor at MIT. He also used his poetry to spread messages. And he wrote the book Chain of Change, which is about the history of the Black community from the 50s to the 70s. And this is the end of the Mel King tour. And now you guys will be on the Malcolm X house. Hi, I'm Erica, and I'm a senior at Needham High School. And next, we'll be heading off to the Malcolm X house in Roxbury, Massachusetts. This particular area was home to many different groups of people before the little family came to own it. The house first held the English within its walls who came for a voyage of natural resources and goods, such as gold, silver, and iron. The English soon left the area, which led to the next group of people that lived here. This was the Irish, and they were also looking for resources like the English. They would also find a lot of gold and iron before leaving the Roxbury area to find more resources. Next came the Native Americans, who weren't looking for resources, but for protection. But as Massachusetts became more colonized, they were pushed out by the European settlers. After the Native Americans were pushed out, the little family would end up owning this home in the near future. Next, I'll talk more about Malcolm's life as he lived in this home and in Roxbury. The house was purchased by Ella in the early 1940s and was made a city landmark in 1988. She was Malcolm's half-sister and was considered one of the most influential people in his life. She would visit Malcolm during his time in foster care and petition the court to have full custody of him, and that was gained in 1941. Malcolm was born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1925. His father, Earl Lee Little, was the leader of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and this is where Malcolm learned about Marcus Garvey's separatist philosophy. After his father died in 1931, he was placed in the foster care system. This is where he would spend his summers with Ella in 1939 and 1940 before moving in. This was one of the first times he was exposed to a predominantly black community and he absolutely loved his time in Roxbury. He would later be sent to prison and discover the nation of Islam. This would cause him to change his last name to X, rejecting the connection that the surname Little holds to white supremacy. Malcolm would spend the rest of his life preaching about the nation of Islam and supporting the civil rights movement by urging black people to protect themselves against white people. Now I'll talk about the impact that this house has on Roxbury. This house is expected to be turned into a home for graduate students who are studying in black history and civil rights. This home has helped Malcolm X to transform into the man he is known as today due to his exposure of the Muslim religion and the black community in Roxbury. But it will also help and transform other people in the Roxbury community who wanna follow in his footsteps. Next, we will go to the Urban League. Hi, I'm Anaya, and this is the last stop on the Nubian tour, Urban League. Today, we're going to be talking to you about the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts, or ULEM, which is located here in Roxbury. Before we can speak about this particular location, however, we thought we'd give some information on the National Urban League movement, which the ULEM is affiliated with. 
The National Urban League, or NUL, was created from the merging of three different organizations focused on the living and working condition of Black Americans in cities. Founded in New York in September of 1910, this organization was initially headed by Ruth Standish Baldwin, an activist in the civil liberties and women's suffrage movements, and Dr. George Edmund Haynes, a sociologist and the first Black student to earn a doctorate from Columbia University. These days, the National Urban League has 95 affiliates, such as ULEM, across the country. They offer services to their communities, which include justice and legal aid, housing and employment, health care, and education. In addition, they provide training and counseling for entrepreneurs and courses in college prep, parenting, and nutrition, among others. Their services reach about 1.7 million people a year. The NUL was also founded the Washington Bureau, which is a branch that does research and policy advocacy. This branch was founded by Hugh B. Price, who was the president and executive officer of the National Urban League from 1994 to 2003. One of the more recent missions of the NUL is to raise voter turnout in the Black community and also fight legislation that suppresses voting across the country. Now I will speak more specifically about the Urban League of Massachusetts and its mission. ULEM was founded in 1917 and affiliated in 1919 and has been in the community for over 100 years. The mission of Urban League is to help adults overcome racial, social barriers, economic inequities, sexual, and domestic violence. Urban League delivers their services to help increase the economic self-reliance for people of color and help advocate for issues that may affect their lives. Urban League also helps unemployed people of color find jobs by allowing them to take free workshop classes that would help their skills and experience in the work they're interested in. In 1920 to 1940 was when this started benefiting many people and becoming very popular. Urban League contains three annual projects for the community. Their Jobs Rebuild Boston Community Conference and Career Fair event is hosted in early June. This event is here for you to help, to help you identify your job skills and pathways to apprenticeship. The Diversity and Inclusion Breakfast is their most important event where they provide unrestricted and financial support for daily operations. On February 4th, ULEM hosts their annual meeting sharing the progress that they have made in the past year. ULEM's hope is to give the most to their community by staying by its side and by supporting it 100%. Now I'll talk more about ULEM's impact in our community. From 2001 to 2019, Darnell L. Williams served as the CEO and president. Current day, Dr. J. Keith Motley has been president since then. The historical impact of the ULEM was helping black residents in the area with employment and healthcare. This was important during the Great Depression when many people around the nation were struggling to find work, but especially helped women. ULEM's impact today is key in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic which affected communities of color and showed unfairness in healthcare, employment, and other institutions. They offer resources for those who were impacted by the pandemic and information on the pandemic itself and health precautions. Urban League trains in important job skills, especially coding, computer usage, and customer service. ULEM is also the only National Urban League affiliate that's providing support and training for domestic violence. ULEM offers two auxiliary programs and other events. The ULEM Guild, which is serving as a champion of civil rights and is dedicated to helping people improve their lives and build stronger communities by providing local residents with education, job training, and placement all for free. The other is the YPN ULEM, or the Young Professional Network of the Urban League of Eastern Mass, and its goal is to support the objective of the National Urban League and promote the development of young professionals in the Boston area. And that concludes your new tour. Thank you.